good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to Strathmore University Business School this afternoon. Allow me to, at this point, uh, indicate to all of us that officially our webinar is uh, starting off. And just a reminder that our theme today is a focus on family business constitution, a pillar for performance and uh, succession. And just quickly to check who is here with us, I invite uh, all of us to send a message on the chat. Just say you indicate your name and the company that you represent. And we'll sample a few just before uh, we dive in with the session. So feel free to please uh, share on the chat. I see we have Devan Shah from Broadway Group of Companies. Thank you, Devan. Esther Shimonio from Aquila East Africa Marketing Agency. Let's keep them coming, we'll sample a few. And then from there, just to have a feel uh, of who is here with us today, Liz Wallace, uh, Chege MD, Kentania Hotels, we have Jerusha, uh, Onyimbo from Mwangaza Electroworks, Mr. Lewis, uh, Terry Kinyua, COO, Invest in Africa, Ashley Kibali from 72 Media Group, uh, Phyllis, David Ndolo, uh, Jimmy Olwoch, Acres of Mercy, just to mention, among the many of us, please keep, uh, keep uh, dialing in, we'll keep uh, recognizing you as we go along. But thank you very much. I see quite a number of companies represented here, Halter Holdings, uh, Acres of Mercy, um, Fortera Consulting, just to mention Yanam Fisheries. Thank you very much, all of you, for gracing us with your presence uh, this afternoon. And so just before we commence, allow me to invite my co-host, um, Eunice, to, to share um, a brief remark but also just to introduce our partners before we go along. Eunice, welcome. Thank you, Hans. Thank you very much. Uh, my, name, my name is Eunice Kimani. I'm the head of entrepreneurial programs at Strathmore University Business School. I'm very excited today to see uh, the numbers trickling in and coming in. I'm so grateful and on behalf of Strathmore University Business School, we want to tell you we are so grateful. Uh, this particular webinar has attracted a lot of, uh, you know, interest outside there. And that makes me feel that uh, this is a wonderful topic for all family owned enterprises. And that means that uh, this will continue attracting people, even as we think of how we are going to push it uh, to the next level. And so I want to take this opportunity to th thank all of you for your time. You've made it to this place and I can see other people still coming in. Thank you, our partners, the Plain Bank. Thank you so much for your time and for your support. Thank you so much, Invest in Africa, for your time. Uh, MasterCard uh, Foundation, thank you for supporting this event. We look forward to having a very interesting and very interactive event today. Uh, and so stay put and let's interact. You know, there is a chat there where you can continue. You know, this is a, a, a chance for you also to uh, tell us about yourself, tell, tell others about yourself. And as we continue, we would be happy to see you engaging us, asking questions, you know. So today we have uh, three blocks of this webinar. Of course, the first part of it, we are going to do the introductions. And then the second part of it, we are going to have the main presentation. And this is actually going to help you go back home with something. At least you are not going empty handed, you're going to go with the knowledge. Uh, and then after that, we are actually now going to have the closing session and the way forward. And so I am so excited to to actually introduce to you the speakers of this webinar today. Together with us, we have uh, Mr. Bharat Jani, the Managing Director of the Prime Bank, and we are so excited to have him as one of our speakers. 
Uh, after him, we shall have Ms. Wangeshi Murioki, uh, the country director, Invest in Africa, Kenya. She's together with us here. We also have uh, one of our own, uh, Dr. Edward Mungai, the deputy vice chancellor of planning and development. And he's also the academic director for the owner manager program, the program you have just seen running in our video. So we are excited because we have such a strong panel, uh, such a strong team. And I know you've come because you are interested. And I know you will be asking a lot of questions. We shall be ready to answer all the questions, looking at the people that we have around here. And so without much ado, I want to bring in uh, our first speaker who will do the opening remarks. And that is none other than our partner, uh, uh, Prime Bank Managing Director, Mr. Barat Jani. Mr. Barat Jani, thank you so much for supporting this event. Uh, please take the, the chance to give us the opening remarks. Welcome. Thank you, Eunice, for inviting us to join hands with Statsmore and also for inviting us to make opening remarks for this webinar on family business constitution, a pillar of performance and succession. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank good you afternoon. all. Thank you all for joining this session today. Virtual forums are the new norm. And as I, we have already adapted to it, except that we will be missing a cup of tea from Stethmore. <laughs> Family-owned businesses are the backbone of global economy. Why am I saying so? 35% of the Fortune 500 companies, one third, are being run by families. And you know some of the famous names that include Walmart, Nike, Samsung, LG, Facebook, BMW, the list is endless. Back home, back home in Kenya, 75% of the GDP is contributed by family owned businesses, lion's share. And they all started as family businesses, and some of them are still run by the family business constitution. And in Kenya, these household names that include Neva Supermarkets, Sorova Hotels, Del Monte, Devki Steel Mills, Broadway Bakery. Bitco, to mention a few. In the banking sector, you can't miss big names like NIC and CBA, now NCBA, INM, and of course, Prime Bank. Founded by Dr. Rasi Kantharia, Prime Bank is a successful family-owned business. It is after 25 years journey, 25 years journey of growth and development that Prime Bank has now diversified its ownership structure with broader shareholding, with broader shareholding structure to include some of the international investors. Today, we are one of the leading peer two banks in Kenya and boast of 115 billion asset base. We have a wide range of products and services that support SME and businesses. At Prime Bank, 
we believe our success as a bank lies on the success of our customers, our partners. And in working the talk, we have partnered with the most reputable school in the field of business studies, Stathmore Business School, to offer our present and prospective clients insights in running family-owned businesses. In fact, this is the first of many forums we intend to host in partnership with Stathmore to ensure that our customers are well equipped with the knowledge to expand and sustainably grow their businesses. I urge all the participants, I understand there are 300 of them, to interact and engage with this key speaker or keynote speaker of the day who has a passion for the subject, Dr. Edward Mungai, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Planning and Development, Stathmore University. And it is for all the participants to implement the family business constitution as a pillar of performance and succession for their businesses. I thank partners, Stathmore Business School, Invest in Africa, MasterCard Foundation for their support. In closing, I would like to invite you all to see our journey as Prime Bank through a short video that is going to be played hereafter. This video is a perfect illustration of how a family-owned business can grow into large, successful corporate to proper structure and governance in place. With those few remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to the session. Thank you. Over to you, moderator. We started Prime Bank in 1992 uh, as a family, and that's the beginning of our journey in financial world. Prime Bank's niche market is high net worth and corporate individual clients. It's a customer-centric bank. It's a caring bank. It's a listening bank. They go the extra mile. You can't have a more solid um, bank that actually you become almost like part of their family. Our service level, I can easily say, is one of the best in the industry. Prime Bank has managed to grow from a relatively small bank uh, a couple of decades ago to what it currently is. And that is really driven by its focus on relationships, uh, by its focus of uh, providing differentiated level of product and service compared to other institutions, especially in a competitive Kenyan market environment. Prime Bank's strength is good governance and teamwork. We succeed because of a highly skilled and experienced team of dedicated employees in Prime Bank. The liquidity of the bank and our balance sheet speaks for itself. What's unique is um, uh, the, the presence of this bank not only in uh, East Africa but also in Southern Africa. Prime Bank is the only Kenyan bank having present in SADC market. We started with opening a bank in Malawi and through Malawi we went in Botswana. Come 2013, we entered Mozambique and Zambia. We entered Zimbabwe by buying out 52% of Barclays Bank Zimbabwe. If you want to go to tier one bank, we need the capital so we can expand and become a bigger bank. Uh, we've invested in over 150 companies in Africa. We're actually one of the oldest private equity fund managers in the continent. Traditionally, Catalyst's investment approach has been to work with best-in-class operators across the region. It starts with trust. Spend uh, time with your future partners. Do we share the same vision and ambitions or not? 
Catalyst and Africa Invest are looking to invest into the bank, which will allow it to deepen its current products and service offering, uh, to come up with uh, other more digitalized mechanisms of reaching their customer base. Digital banking is the future of banking in Kenya. We have got the highest penetration of internet uh, amongst the entire Africa, and the modification of the model would be going digital. Our investors include a number of international development institutions from Kenya, from broader Africa, Europe and the US. We will be the ambassadors uh, of uh, Prime Bank and uh, facilitate the introductions. We are a leading commercial bank and they have got the knowledge of the market and support of development financial institutions. Together it will blend well for future growth. We have a similar approach to investing and value creation. Uh, which will ideally allow for the bank uh, to benefit from the respective strength of each institution. We're very proud and we're very excited and uh, we're convinced that uh, this will be a successful investment. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Barat, on behalf of Prime Bank and for that amazing video, just to give us a feel of the amazing things that happen at uh, Prime Bank. All right, um, just so that we don't uh, take as much time and allow you to hear from the main uh, speaker of the day, uh, I will now invite Mrs. Ms. Um, Wangeshi Muriuki. Um, who is the country director for Kenya at uh, Invest in Africa, just to also give some remarks in, in, in terms of context setting. And then from there now, we will usher all of us into the main session. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Ongesh. Thank you very, very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. I am very, very pleased and uh, delighted to be joining this um, great webinar that is organized by Strathmore University Business School in partnership with Prime Bank, Invest in Africa, and the MasterCard Foundation. And just mention that I represent Invest in Africa as a country director, and I'm indeed very proud to be partnering with Strathmore and also to be joined by uh, Prime Bank and MasterCard Foundation just to showcase the power of partnership and how important this topic really is. So um, the webinar we have today on a family business uh, constitution and this being such a strong pillar for performance and succession is so significant being discussed uh, in our day and uh, our time. And I also want to commend Mr. Jani for his very passionate uh, remarks. He has said almost everything that I could have said. And therefore I'm going to be very, very brief, but uh, thank you so much. And uh, I must say I'm inspired by the story and the journey of uh, Prime Bank. So first of all, just before I, I, I begin, I would like to just talk um, briefly about Invest in Africa, the organization that I represent, and what we do and why this is important. So we are a leading African investment and trade accelerator that is Pan-African. Uh, we have got presence in six African countries, mostly in Western and Southern Africa. And uh, Invest in Africa coordinates efforts across sectors together with the private and the public sector to drive greater investment through our members and our wider network. So we are a high impact network in private sector. We are also nonprofit and we are working with one objective to drive the socioeconomic growth and job creation in Africa by focusing on small and medium enterprises. So we are inspired by that firm belief that small and medium enterprises where also family businesses are uh, constituted are catalysts for economic growth. And really without them, we can't create jobs. 
So they are the heartbeat for why we exist. And they are also the heartbeat that defines our partnership with the Strathmore Business, uh, the Strathmore University Business School. So uh, on our network, we are working with about 5,000 entrepreneurs of different types, sectors, and we bring them together within an ecosystem by partnering with uh, corporates, investors, impact investors, all coming together to support these medium enterprises by focusing on three things, providing access to markets, access to skills, and access to finance. And to date, uh, I'm just uh, very glad to mention that we have been able to create about 80,000 jobs for the last um, four years. And we have been partnering with the Strathmore University from the onset back in 2016, when Invest in Africa was founded in Kenya. So today's webinar theme on family business constitution is significant, as I said. And uh, just as uh, Mr. Jani has mentioned to us uh, from research, you know, family farms dominate the business landscape, not only in Kenya, but also uh, across the globe, across the to uh, Fortune, um, you know, the Fortune 500 companies. And they account for over 50% of our gross domestic pro uh, product and employment. So we cannot ignore these businesses because of the vital role they are playing um, in our economy. And, and we know that, as he has, he has said, that two thirds of all companies globally you know, are from this particular constitution. But sadly, we know the story in Kenya. We know the story about uh, family businesses in Africa. They die with the owner. And the question is, why does that happen? So the reason why Strathmore University is leading and championing this course through cutting edge research, good programs, is to change that narrative and create strong companies that can live beyond tomorrow. It saddens me when I open the newspapers and I see businesses that are collapsing have a certain trend. They tend to be family led. You know, they are bedeviled with lots of conflict. And, 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 you know, as soon as the owner ceases, the business also ceases, but that's not really what it should be. We are here to learn about the best practice and how we can start that journey and how we have good partners like the university that can work with you on that journey. Now, from our work we, uh, and, and the ecosystem that, uh, you know, we are developing and leading for entrepreneurs, in 2019, I just wanted to mention that we conducted a study, uh, I think it was in mid 2019, on our SMEs, and we wanted to just wrap our heads around this same topic on succession, on future survival. So we, we, we sampled some of our SMEs, and we were asking them questions related to tomorrow, you know, succession and, and, and things like that. And our study revealed that at that point, that was in, in 2019, 66% of businesses cited that their biggest worry then was their future survival. They were just wondering, entrepreneurs and business owners, will they survive? And we further inquired how many of them had succession plans, including business plans. Only 20% of businesses surveyed had those plans you know, 55% did not have any plan for succession in case anything happened to their business. And this really got us to start thinking around it. How do we empower, how do we ensure that businesses are thinking more closely about this, that entrepreneurs are not just looking, living for the day. We've just heard about the amazing story of, 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 of our prime Bank, I personally didn't know that Prime Bank was a family business. And if we do have such successful case studies, it also means that for you and for I, your business can actually become that global company for tomorrow. 
And therefore, we don't have to die alone as entrepreneurs, as we are saying, we don't have to struggle. You have partners, you have Invest in Africa, you have Strathmore and many others. And that's why we, have, we, are, we are coming together. We are teaming up because we know this is big. The opportunity is huge and we can't just do it alone. We can't lead and champion this as Invest in Africa alone. We believe in working together with partners and synergize and be able to deliver or complement efforts of, of the university. Like I said, for us, we offer linkages for financing, we offer linkages for markets, and Strathmore then becomes such a strong partner for Invest in Africa to help us in solving those, those systemic challenges within the business, you know, putting together these businesses, supporting you with strong processes so that we can, we can develop SMEs together in a way that really um, uh, moves the dial, the dial. And finally, I just want to say that, you know, let's articulate the changing dynamics and uh, complexity of the environment that we live in today and just be open-minded. You know, we are now facing COVID. COVID has caused many businesses to shut down and they're starting to think about survival, you know, putting together plans in place. But beyond COVID, let's think about sustainability. Let's think about having these constitutions in, in our organizations, building those processes because it's going to affect your performance and it will also determine your success uh, tomorrow. Kenya remains and East Africa remains one of the most attractive markets for private equity investors. And, and, and investors are constantly scouting for good businesses. You know, they know that Kenya is known to be a hub, but when they come into our businesses, they don't see that. They just see the entrepreneur. They don't see the processes. They don't see the governance, you know, and, and, and that's why we need to shift our thinking and the reality that we are in. There are many opportunities for your business and we just need to become, start thinking about sustainability, think about future. And I believe, that's the reason why we are here today. So don't die with your knowledge, you know. Don't, don't live for yourself as an entrepreneur. And I'll just wrap up by asking you again, beyond the business, is there a tomorrow for your company? How are you thinking about success? How are you thinking about succession? Let's embrace this best practice. Let's adopt uh, the family business constitution because indeed it is a pillar of performance and succession. So I just want to thank Strathmore University once again, um, uh, the business school, such a premier school for organizing this um, as a leader and just acknowledge that Strathmore have made a significant contribution in this field. And therefore I'm really looking forward to learning, to exchanging, uh, and, and, and to just hearing more and more insights from entrepreneurs. So thank you very much and let's enjoy the session. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fungeshi. The tagline there is what is going to happen to your business in the future. So as we continue to marinate on that, <laughs> Uh, we will then now transition to our next speaker. Thank you very much uh, for Mr. Barat and uh, for Ms. Wangeshi for setting the bar too high for us. Uh, we hope to meet um, the obligation and uh, ensure that by the end of this, the discussions would have been worthwhile. Ladies and gentlemen, feel free to, on the chat, to continue to let us know even in the country you're from. I've noticed one, two people from Uganda as well. Thank you very much for joining us. And already I see we are, we are almost close to 250 participants who've already joined us in this discussion. Thank you very much. Allow me at this point then to invite Dr. Edward Ngai, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Planning and Development at the Strathmore University, and who is also our Academic Director for the Owner Manager Program, which is a flagship program for entrepreneurs here at the Strathmore University Business School. He's going to take us through the main session 
on family business constitution, a pillar for performance and succession. Dr. Edward Mungai. Thank you, Hans, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So happy to join this uh, session and uh, to contribute to this uh, very, very important topic. I obviously want to appreciate uh, our sponsors, our partners, and uh, that's Prime Bank, Invest in Africa, and Mastercard Foundation. And for those uh, very good opening remarks, we tie up to our session today about the uh, family business constitution, a pillar for performance and succession. As uh, Hans has mentioned, uh, I have uh, different laws in the university. I think particularly important to, for me today is the two roles, one of them, which is uh, being the academic director of the owner manager program, and also being a director at the Strathmore Dispute Resolution Center, uh, and other things that will come up as we proceed. So first of all, I want to say that uh, the interest of this program is quite uh, extraordinary. I mean, as Hans has just mentioned, my colleague, we are almost busting the limit of our Zoom. You know, we normally have a maximum of 300. We already put in 250. I think this is one of the unique uh, webinars we have had where the numbers just keep growing and growing, especially because sometimes we get people registered, but they don't show up. But this is one where practically everybody uh, has come to join the session. And I think this demonstrates the importance of this particular session. So I'm looking forward to having an engaging session. Uh, this is going to be quite interactive. I have prepared a few slides and we'll use them as a guide, but I'll keep coming back to you and asking you to comment uh, as we proceed. Uh, let me first of all, uh, but, uh, obviously thanking Mr. Barat, Jani and his uh, Prime Bank team uh, to, for giving that example of what uh, family businesses could do. I like the various examples at a global level but it's very good to connect with something that is local so that people don't sort of think this happens outside. So I'm very happy for sharing that example, but additionally also to see that it's very important to work with partners like you are doing now, because you bring your strength, you bring your clients who also will benefit from the programs that we do in the business school. And of course, Invest in Africa, as Wangish has told us, you see, uh, the, the entrepreneurs will know that there is always more money looking for good opportunities. And on one hand, entrepreneurs say there is no money. Okay, investors say, if only you can structure your business well, we have the money ready for you. I think that's one of the challenges that uh, Invest in Africa will be facing, where they have investors, they're looking for money. And the same thing with Prime Bank, I saw Catalyst, of course, uh, there in the video for Prime Bank, they will also be looking for that. So this is a good session, it's not called a win-win. I also want to recognize, I've seen a couple of our alumni who are joining us for today of the different programs uh, in the business school and the university. And this is one way we try to make sure that we stay connected. Uh, and we are happy that when you come, then you learn one or two things, you go and improve your business and you keep coming back. So uh, this is good. So uh, with me, I have a few colleagues. I want to recognize one person who I'm going to be reaching out once in a while as we proceed is a colleague director at the Strathmore Dispute Resolution Center. Uh, his name is Senior Counsel Anthony Gross, who is logged in somewhere. Anthony, at some point, I'll reach out to you. Uh, Anthony is a, a, a partner, senior partner at the AFG Gross uh, Advocate, but also is working with us here at the Strathmore Dispute Resolution Center, where he's a director. So we are happy that some people said some questions when they were registering. And some of those of questions uh, touch on legal issues. So I thought that uh, let's reach out to my colleague and he's very happy to step in uh, when those questions do come. Otherwise, we have a big team from the business school that's also supporting the background, which will come in at different points as we proceed. So let me ask uh, uh, Hans, who is helping me, my colleague, to share the slides. And then I will start getting started and then uh, I'll guide uh, the discussion as we proceed. Uh, as you will see from this slide, um, the, the idea is that uh, we'll start, uh, so I've given uh, my introduction, but just before we leave this title, you know, you know, I was thinking, why do we have, have uh, 
so many people registering. And you know, in Kenya, you have this talk about BBI. <laughs> so I thought maybe some people thought you're talking about BBI here, no? <laughs> but when I saw some people from outside the country, then I said, okay, uh, we didn't make a mistake. Uh, the topic is family business constitution, appeal for performance as a special. And uh, next slide, uh, hands for me. So you will find that what we have done is to try to, this is the agenda for what I'm going to cover. I will have like two parts. So I'll stop somewhere in the middle just to, uh, to form a break, but very short. Uh, so these are more one or two slides. So don't get worried that there are too many things. So we start by defining what's a family business constitution and quickly show the impact of this uh, FBC as we call it on business performance. Then I'll bring in my friend, Anthony Gross, to talk about this family business constitution and the rule of succession, because uh, they overlap a bit and it's good to see if you have a family business constitution, how does this impact or to the rule of succession? Then from there, we proceed to say, if you wanted to write, if you are convinced that this is something you need to do, what's the process of writing one? But, and in fact, that process is what it is to, how to deal with the consequences of the, of the big challenge of succession planning, as we are going to see. Then to close, uh, we'll bring a few slides on why it's using mediation. In family business, I think last year was quite unique. Uh, we had quite a number of very good family businesses that have really had challenges. We have seen them in court. But as we are going to see, uh, it will be very, very important to consider using mediation to resolve these kind of disputes. And then finally, I want to bring in the challenge because another important challenge that family businesses face, which they think about marriage. When people get married in the family or the issues of divorce and how also that can be taken care of uh, in the family business constitution. And then finally, by the end, you have not answered any questions. Uh, we'll try to answer them as we proceed. Then we have a few minutes uh, for Q&A. That's it. Uh, so stay engaged. Yes, next slide. Yes, that's it. Stay engaged. So if there are any comments you want to put, put them on the chat, Hans will help me to keep looking at it. If you want to talk, you can lift your hand. I've seen some people are trying to do that. And we have uh, also incorporated uh, two anonymous polls just to get a bit of feedback uh, on what people know about what we are talking about and at the end sort of get an evaluation of what's going on. So if you have a cup of tea or mug, uh, this is a sign, but the screen is like what you see there. We'll try to make this quite engaging. So there we go, let's get started. So Hans. So first of all, this we, I, uh, yesterday afternoon, I think uh, we were trying to look at the numbers of the registration. And uh, we had about, by that time, about 200 people registered. And we tried to just get a, a sense of the participants who are here, so that when we are doing the, this presentation, we keep it in mind. As you can see, majority of the numbers of people we have here are running small companies, about 58%, uh, with about five people, and then the rest uh, increase the highest number. We have a few people who are running companies that have about 200 people. So you have uh, up to, to, to five, then up to 20, then 20 to 50, and uh, above 200. So, so you can see the bulk of the company. And this is in, something good to keep in mind because one of the questions we, we, we are asked is when do you exactly write this family business constitution? When do you start? Do you wait or do you start when it's young? On the other side of the slide, I have tried to highlight uh, several countries beyond Kenya that are represented in the, in the session today. So you can see we have tried to reach out to many, many other countries and I'm happy uh, the friends uh, in the United States, uh, if they are in now, then uh, this is pretty early in the morning. So I, we recognize the effort you're putting into this. And of course, uh, I think that's my friend Carlos from Spain. Uh, so we had registered Carlos. So Carlos is a visiting faculty uh, in our business school. He teaches in the family business courses. And you can actually see he's making effort to join us from Spain. And the other representation, uh, we, uh, we acknowledge your participation. Next slide, Hans. So we will do the first poll uh, to try and get a sense of your knowledge of the family business constitution. Uh, so that uh, as we are talking, then you can get a sense of uh, what people have been. This is anonymous, an anonymous poll. So whatever feedback you give us, we only count the people who are moderating who not know who answered yes or no. So let's take a few minutes uh, to answer the poll. So as I able to launch the poll, I do it from my side. Okay, so we can launch the poll. Oh, uh, 
so those who have used Zoom before, you know, the question will show up, just click whether yes or no, good or average, and from our side, we'll be able to see the statistics. Yeah, so start uh, voting now, and then we'll see how people are responding to these questions. Yeah, we can see the voting. Uh, people are going on. Yeah, soon or later. So thank you for voting. Uh, we are getting a sense of where we stand. Hans will keep me the numbers here. Uh, we'll share the results once uh, we close it. So we still have about 50% of people have voted. So let's give it one or two other minutes. Yeah, um, going on well. So we're just about to close it. We have 60% people voted. Uh, I'm trying to see how many families have current knowledge average. Uh, so two minutes, one, hands, yes, that's a little 370%, we are just about there and then we'll cross the voting. And I think this is, uh, when I'm looking at the results from my side here, we are going to share them in a short while. It shows the interest for this. Um, I think Hans, we can stop it. Uh, add the poll now. Okay, you can share the results. Yeah, so I guess you can see the results from your side, uh, who shows that, uh, Uh, which shows that uh, on average, uh, in terms of uh, your current knowledge about the family business constitution, uh, we have people have an average knowledge, that sort of seems to be, but it's quite, if you add the people who think that it's poor, then uh, we have quite a number who will benefit from the session. Uh, the fact how many family businesses have a constitution that most of people don't have, I, that's not a surprise. Uh, if people don't know about it. And finally, in the question of trying to get, let me come closer to the screen, uh, the idea about uh, having a will. Okay, so, and this ties to a very important question we come up later, the family business constitution, lighting the will. Again, more, majority of people don't have, uh, which is uh, something that uh, now gives us a sense that the knowledge you are going to share will be beneficial to our participants. So thanks a lot. I'll ask Han to uh, move on to stop sharing the result. And then we can talk about this family business constitution. Now, I, I made the joke about uh, BBI and the constitution, but I mean, to set, to set the space, uh, the idea here is that, you know, countries have constitutions. You can stop sharing, Hans. Nick is still sharing from my side. And then uh, we go back to the slide. So, um, just like countries have constitutions, uh, then also family businesses, especially the ones who are well established, need to have a constitution, which is a document of agreement about the family. How do we learn our things? When you talk about the constitution of a country, then it actually governs how the country is run. I mean, and that, that's why the discussion of the BPA comes here. You, know? you are trying to discuss at this point how we maybe improve on how we manage the country in a divided discussion about that. But the same thing would have been for uh, businesses. So what we are going to, uh, Hans, you can show the next slide. What we are going to talk about now is that that agreement for a family business, which would help it address the main issues that you're talking about, okay? So in, in terms of the challenges, if I was to ask you, we don't have to do that. If when we have run uh, uh, questions about uh, businesses, we always ask, the, 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 the results can still be seen, at least from my screen. Uh, maybe it's mine. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hans, it's mine. Okay, so when you talk about, we, we ask people about challenges. Uh, as I said, I'm involved in teaching family business courses and entrepreneurship. These three circles is where all the challenges arise. Okay, you can see there are three intersecting circles in a family business. One, uh, the, the one is because there, there is a family, there is a business, and they are the owners. 
And I don't have to give the details of all those seven numbers, number one, two, three, but this is a challenge that you have people that, for example, in number one, these are family members who do not own the business and are not employed by the business, you know, but they are family members. Or you can have number two, which are people who are not family members, they have shares in the business. Okay, these are this possibility. Or number three, which would be people who are employed in the business, these are managers, they are not members of the family and they have no shares uh, in the company. And of course, the intersecting circles are people that cross uh, three, but number seven is unique, where you have family members who are shareholders, but they're also working in the business. Okay, so this is the interaction that makes the management of family business uh, complicated because depending on who you are and who you are talking to, the issues can very, be very different, okay? And this is what, when you come for a family business course or the entrepreneurship course, we try to relate with the two main issues that are related to governance, okay? Governance, and one of them is, of course, is the succession planning issue. And then the other thing is structuring the ownership uh, of the company. And we are going to see how the family business constitution can help us uh, resolve these issues. Next slide. So uh, now, over time, people have tried to study these uh, three, three circles I've shown in the previous slide. Okay, and what you see in this slide is the first of all the recognition of the two separate things that have to, to interrelate. So you have the family side and you have the business side. Okay, on the business side, we start there. You have the yellow, which is the shareholders. In all businesses, they have to have shareholders. Those shareholders will, will have are the ones who own the company but they appoint directors who are then in charge of managing the company on behalf of the shareholders, of course, they appoint, appoint managers. You can obviously have an advisory council to support, uh, but they don't have fiduciary role uh, responsibility in the company. So that is quite well known. For this session, if we are going to move out with anything, is to recognize the importance of having the other part. Okay, from what you have just seen in the previous seven and uh, type of role you need to manage the, a structure to manage the family the same way so on the top you have the family assembly that's what we call it and this is where you have all the family members whether they're in business they are not in business but they are family members okay that circle that we talked about family irrespective of whether they're employed their shareholders you need them okay for different reasons out of that family assembly then you need what we call a family council these are representatives of the family. You could recall them like they are the directors, but they are not, but a council of quote unquote representatives of the family who are the ones that interact with the business. Okay? And that family council then can have like sub, 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 sub committees. And here we just give two examples of two subcommittees, an important one, of course, being the one about education, okay? How you educate members. But also there is a thing about career planning, which ties the thing about succession planning, uh, grooming young kids that we may want to join the business and all that. You can obviously have other subcommittees, but these are just like two important ones. So as you are going to see, as we go on then, in the family business constitution, what you're talking about is managing this side of the family and how it interacts with the business. Okay, so who is sits in the family council? What can they do with the directors? All those kind of issues. So that members of the family who are not in the family council don't have to interfere with the business. So the business somehow is protected. But they also the reverse. When the directors want to engage with the family, who do they engage with on the family side? They know who are the members of the family council. That council requires a document to manage how it operates, who gets elected, who gets to leave, all those kind of things. This is the objective of the family business constitution. And we are going to see a bit of details. Uh, next slide, uh, and then we'll have some interaction here. So I have said the, uh, the family is, is sometimes called family constitution. That's why I put the business in bracket. When you read some of the papers, they don't say family business constitution. It's just about family constitution because you can broaden it beyond just the business. And you see that when you come to the issue of marriage when I said earlier on. Uh, so it's also called in some countries, uh, especially in Europe, the family uh, protocol, sometimes called the family creed because it's an agreement. And then you have the four bullets, of, is an agreement about what? So the first is an agreement about the values, 
and that's what I'll summarize it. First of all, the values of the business. Why do we have a family business? Is it just to create wealth? Is it support educating our children? Is it supposed to have an impact to society? What exactly is the driving mindset of the founder of the family business? And this question cannot be taken lightly, okay? Because it's one of the things that breaks family business because the founder thinks this way, the children thinks another way. But if you write a family business constitution, the founder is able to sell his idea about what the family business is all about, okay? And uh, then to the mission, this is number two, it's about the values, mission, and vision of the family business, okay? I already talked about number one, which is the way it governs the relationship between the family business and the family itself. So this agreement, and we are going to see a bit of detail, captures those things, so how we relate and what the, the, the values now. This document needs to be signed uh, by each new family member, okay? So for example, when a young man decides to get married or a young lady gets to get married, then you have someone who comes in. There has to be, a, that person needs to be inducted to know what the family business is all about. Now, the family would agree, do they become part of the family council or not? But you cannot leave it for granted, assuming that that person has come in, okay, does not have an impact on the family business. And we'll see as we go on, especially on the side of marriage, that this can be very important. Some people, if you are married to a family business, they can really increase the value. But if they are not, then they can also bring it down. So these things are important. Then, of course, being a constitution like you are doing now, it also has to be reviewed regularly, OK? I don't know, Hans, if there's any questions or comments that uh, we may need to respond. I think it's good to interact. If there's any on the chat, I can take one. Uh, but if there isn't, I'll proceed to the next one, OK? Um, so this is, a, in a nutshell, what the family business is all about. And we'll see in a bit of detail, uh, Hans, you can go to the next slide as we look for the questions, uh, as to what uh, would be incorporated in that family business. Next, Hans. There we are. So when you look at the document of a family business, the structures can change. Of course, uh, given uh, the size of the family business, uh, the size of the family, uh, and the country sometimes, all those things. But these are like five main things that have to go to the family business constitution document. So the content has to cover about the values. We have talked about that one. It has to talk about how the family in business here, if I move a bit closer here, this is about a very important thing. Uh, I think one of the questions we got uh, in, in a, by the people registering is how do I encourage my children to join our family business? Okay, and this, is, and this is a question we get even when we run the programs here at the business school. That is not a simple question to, to answer uh, because one thing, and uh, there is literature to support all this, there is research to support all this, one thing is where you sort of quote unquote force the, the, the children to, to become part of the business, okay? And of course they are coming there unwillingly. And of course that means that they will obviously not be fully dedicated to it. And of course with time, they may actually start doing other things. So force never works. The thing is, how do you make sure that they're coming in willingly? Now, in a well thought out family business constitution, as you saw, I talked about the education committee. The point is that you start inducting these children very early on in the family business, okay? But as you have seen successful cases in Kenya, it doesn't mean that that child has to work in your family business. In fact, uh, where it has been successful in some cases, you can never generalize 100%, is where the children have worked outside. They prove themselves, then they come inside, okay? This is the, the, so they actually know I have the option to work out. But if they have already been inducted, they have been coming freely, then they may opt to come and work in. Of course, things are different, but these are model that really works. I know one family business in Kenya, very successful group, where actually that's one of the conditions they have put for their, for their children in the family. That if you want to become, let's say, the director of marketing for a family business, then you first of all go out and get employed by another company as a director of marketing. We will take you to study, you can go for your master's, you can do whatever course you want, but first of all, get employed out there as a director of marketing. Then now you can come in. 
Okay, and, and that, that really helps. So with that mindset, you can see why an education committee is very, very important in supporting the company to go ahead, okay? Uh, appointment of directors to the board. You know, you don't just get a, a child who has not really business experience and put them in the board. You know, they will not be contributing. So, but if you have thought about it, how are you going to inculcate and develop values of a good child who has fit in the board? You may have to work around it and get that child in other boards. Then they come to your company. All those things can be seen. Okay, this is what you're talking about, okay? Uh, now, the other question is an interesting one, to avoid nepotism. Okay, one of the, the research papers I've read, uh, read uh, I think, uh, last month, Okay, very recent one. It's about this thing about the concept of nepotism. Okay, uh, because uh, he, uh, uh, Ford, the Ford Motor Vehicle Company, you know, Henry Ford, when he was retiring, he appointed his child as the CEO of Ford Motor, Motor Corporation, and he was accused of nepotism. It was a big issue in the US. But you know, the fact that he had been able to help the child and grow, the company grew. Okay, so now you can be accused of nepotism, but if the person who is succeeding is actually the able person, you can deal with that, uh, that uh, thing. So the people is justifying the one I read about how you can actually prepare the children so that when you appoint them, nobody can say about nepotism. Governance, you have touched on it. Uh, and here I can just get a bit of detail, okay, because it's important. So we talked about family council. So imagine a family that let's say in, in a Kenyan situation, you think this is now less and less, but you have a family where they have, you know, quote unquote, the, the, the founder, I assume he's a man, uh, they could be a red, but I assume he's a man for now to illustrate the example, has several wives, okay? Okay, now in the family council, you need to have representation of these wives and their children. Now, those different homes or houses, not homes, houses, would have to appoint representation to what we call the family council. And this is very important. This is irrespective of whether the person has one children, no children, or whatever it is. Now, then the council will, be direct, direct, will have a policy that says how do we appoint who represent the, the family in the business. That's what you're talking about here. So you can then have these people going to the family, to, to, the, to the business. I. I, I I, I see here that some of the people running the, the, the business majority have small businesses. Now, you can see why this is very important to do it when you have a small business, because you can agree on that structure now. Why is that important? In, in this example I was giving, if this uh, founder, the children start getting married, and you don't have that structure in place, then the possibility exists that one of the family will grow too big and the other family will remain small because these ones have gotten married many children. And that just opens a kind of wall when you come to accession issues. But if you already put a family constitution that says each of the families will be represented by one person, then what happens at that home or that house that has one wife with many children, they just have to get one person to sit in the council. And you protect the business for generations. But if you don't have that, when the more this one uh, house has more children, the more the likelihood that they start saying that these guys are benefiting more than we are, all those kind of challenges. So in a nutshell, the idea you can have a family business constitution. As long as there's something that people can inherit, the better for the survival of the business. Now, there's the agreement about ownership. Um, and, the, and this, of course, has to be uh, captured also in the shareholders' agreement. Okay, how many shares go to the family business? But an important thing there is the transfer of shares among family members. Because as a founder, you may want to protect that even though I have brought in outsiders to invest the business, the shares that you have left uh, for the family members stay within the family members. So there, there has to be an agreement between what the family business constitution says and what happens in the shareholders agreement. And then finally, about dispute resolution. Okay, and we have said it's very important that you capture in the family business constitution how disputes will be resolved. Disputes are no more life issues. They happen, every, we are human beings. The challenge is we seem not to anticipate and agree how we are going to resolve them. 
I think last year to me was, and that's one of the reasons we decided to run this session, was particularly painful to see some of the companies that we really would have wished would never face these challenges in the press, in court, and really destroying value. And of course, for some of the companies that you don't have to mention, also taking other companies that were their suppliers or clients with them, okay? Now, that is one reason is because you don't have a dispute resolution clause that says, if we have a problem, let's sit down and agree before we go to court. Because the moment you go to court, even the public and the customers, the value start being destroyed. So those are, uh, and I have that example there of an article, those who want to read, uh, that gives a bit more detail about this. Hans, uh, if you don't mind, and uh, I'm just about to call my friend, uh, uh, we can skip that. I think I'll go through it, it's a bit of detail. Uh, so just so that we can show that I tried to look at the adoption, and I, I like the example given that those countries that saw this area, you can see like Finland, this was a study done in 2017 uh, by PwC about family businesses in different countries, about 2,800 of them. And you can see in Finland, oh, 63% of these businesses had a family business constitution. And going down that way, you have India, you have Germany, US, UK, China, and Japan. So you can see that the idea of having a family business is getting global acceptance because of the reasons you have just highlighted. So it's not something that is new, uh, maybe in this part of the world. Next slide. Thanks. So here I would have asked my friend Carlos, who is there, because this is an example from Spain. This talks about the impact of farm of the family business on, uh, on performance. So I tried to look around to see whether the other example, this is a unique case because here, thanks to the Spanish uh, uh, way of doing things that I think they got some grant, you have a, 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 a study about 530 family businesses. Half of them, 265, were supported to, to write a family business constitution and the other 265 did not have one. And then over a series of years, you can see 2003 to 2013, 10 years, they were tracked on performance, just to see whether they, they, the impact on financial performance was different. And you can see the results are very, there was a positive relationship between the implementation and the future performance, particularly where, and these are good details, okay? You see, when you have a family business constitution, then you have have to think who gets appointed as a family, as a CEO, okay? Now, you see that for where the, the company is appointed a non-family CEO, then it, it, was, it was even better performance. Now, you know one of the challenges that we have for family business is when you want to Okay, so you can hear I'm back. Sorry, the, there was a slight interruption. So the family business constitution would agree, for example, who can become a CEO of the family business. So if it comes to replacing the CEO and none of the family members qualify, then it is easy to get an external CEO and the family members will support that CEO. They will not be undermining the CEO because they know why the CEO was external. But you also see the need to have the education committee because ordinarily a family business would prefer to have a family member as a CEO. So you educate your children, uh, your cousins, you know, even the bigger family, because maybe that's where you get a good family CEO. But to keep the study, you can see the several things are differentiated. So non-family CEO, multiple family owners, okay? So you bring more people, and of course, later generation control the farm. So you don't have the founders still holding a big percentage. In fact, looking at uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Barat made in the opening remarks about the big companies like uh, Walmart, uh, all these big companies, uh, BMW, you'll find that, uh, and this is studied, about 30% seems to be a unique ratio that helps families to keep control. Of course, you have to have the roles, but also to let the company grow. So the moment the family is controlling for those large companies, above 30, 35%, 30 
seems to be a challenge. They have too much power. But that five, and of course, you have to have the roles that uh, uh, helps in appointment of directors and the rest to, to accompany this. That seems to be a like of an ideal kind of a, a ratio to keep. But that helps then to bring in generations or later generations in the family to the business. So I want you to keep this in mind because for this session, one of the things we wanted to show is the impact of the family business constitution on uh, uh, farm performance. And this study just demonstrates that this is worth the investment. Over a 10-year period, they are able to do better. Uh, Hans. Mm -hmm. So I want to invite my colleague now, uh, Anthony Gross, uh, because now that we see that family business constitution is important and can help, one of the questions that we are asked is how does this sort of overlap with the succession when I want to write a will? And uh, we have a few notes there to guide Mr. Anthony Gross uh, to read us in this particular study. Warren Gross, are you with us? Anton? And I don't know if you can see me. I've uh, opened my video. I don't see what you're seeing. Anyway, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Edward Mungai. Um, I was interested to see in your poll the extraordinary statistic of how many people do not have a will. Now, that might be a cultural um, thing, but I tend to think that there is confusion, particularly in uh, high uh, asset uh, families, of how you differentiate between a will and a trust maybe, and now what we are suggesting is some form of family business constitution. Now, the problem with the will is it is slightly exclusive and limiting. You will need to have executors who are also trustees, and you are trying to um, um, gauge uh, three things. You're trying to ensure that there are guardians of your minor children. You're trying to ensure that your business colleagues or elders of your family are the people who people will respect to, uh, to administer the assets. And, um, but nevertheless, it's somewhat exclusive and can take a long time to prove probate in court, particularly if other family members challenge it, particularly if somebody has been left out of it, you can be in court for a long time challenging the uh, testator's wish for a smooth succession. So if you don't have a will, then maybe you want to set up a trust, but the trust also has the same story of trustees who you appoint during your lifetime, but then may go on to be incapable of running the business or they're not, uh, they don't have the experience or the uh, qualities to help run the various businesses. And the, there is no oversight on the trustees. And once again, it is uh, somewhat uh, exclusive. So the idea of the family business constitution is to bring about inclusivity, is to bring about the feeling that all the families are um, involved. Now in Kenya, this is particularly relevant because if you look at the newspapers and we are aware of our uh, laws that allow uh, polygamous houses and polygamous houses can have up to four uh, wives of which there may be many children and many grandchildren and the patriarch or testator or founder of the businesses may still be alive. And at that time, he needs to encourage all the family members or make sure that there is a format of everybody's voice being heard at least. So nobody comes to challenge either the will or the businesses which have resulted in all these disputes. And um, as, as has been said before, we see in more and more uh, disputes in the courts at the, and, and businesses uh, being disruptive. Just so that you know where I'm coming from, from SDRC, the Strathmore Dispute Resolution Center, we espouse mediation and Edward and I have always thought 
that mediation would be the perfect way of introducing dispute resolution into family businesses. And it fits very well with the uh, family business constitution because uh, you don't wait for anybody to decide there is a dispute. Uh, there are given timelines for the matter to go to mediation immediately and your family constitution will be the basis of the people who should be around that table. Um, Edward, I haven't looked at your slide, but have I covered everything here? Thanks, uh, Anthony. I think one important thing is to, 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 to cover there about uh, the complementarity of the family business constitution and the will or the trust or whatever the person wants uh, to write. So how to make sure that they talk to each other? You could uh, address that. Well, as of today, most people in this um, on this webinar will know that uh, companies have shareholders and directors and articles of association which um, guide how the company is to be run. Uh, they will know that in big businesses or joint ventures, you will need um, shareholders agreements, which will bind the shareholders to act in certain ways, particularly if certain shareholders are minorities. You might have confidentiality agreements, which also impact on the business. And the, on that, that's on the business side. Then you have your will, whereby you're difficultly, during your lifetime, you are leaving um, your assets, which are still open-ended. None of us know when we're gonna die, other than the fact that it will happen. And maybe most of us are not ready for it. So you won't have prepared that will or the will will be um, stale by the time it's proven in court or many other uh, uh, circumstances. And so the idea of this family business constitution is an overall umbrella that brings all these things together and says the family must be involved to foster the testator, the founder's wishes to keep his legacy alive and to keep the businesses going. Okay, thanks Anthony. One more thing uh, you could address. Uh, we had discussed the pros and cons of having, having a family business constitution as a legal document. Uh, whether you want it to be legal or you want it to be something that is not a legal document. Well, this is an interesting uh, question because everybody would think that what is the point if it's not binding? Uh, what is the point of having uh, this family constitution that all the family must sign if it's not going to be legally binding? Well, the difficulty here is, do you want it to be legally binding? Because say um, a high-end um, uh, founder uh, has 20 businesses, all with different directors, different shareholders, some of the family involved. He tries to make sure that all the family involved, but some do well, some don't do well. You have these shareholders agreements. All these are binding documents at law and by statute. But the idea is of the FBC is much more flexible. It is giving you the space for everybody to have a say and to have the founder's wishes set out as to how it should work and how it, they, the businesses are to look after the family, how they're to look after education of um, minor children, how they're to look after the possible um, medical circumstances of unfortunate members of the family. And, None of this is going to be able to be done by shareholders and directors because that's that's not their that's not their remit. That's not where they're they're coming from. So I see the FBC as having tremendous um, flexibility in not being binded. Obviously, the, the the main thing why can't it be binding? Because you're adding people every single year. As you said, there may be new wives, there may be new children, there may be new grandchildren, there may be um, marriages, there may be deaths, there may be divorces. And all this means that you can't keep writing a, a binding agreement. 
but you can um, just add to the uh, family constitution fairly easily by adding these members when the when the family constitutional um, uh, administrators meet at that stage all the families will be represented and they can add these other family members to it okay so thanks anthony i think uh, at some point uh... We we'll obviously may get some questions from the participants. In fact, there have been a few, and I think thanks for those who are uh, participating and can respond to the question. I've seen somebody has answered the question about registering a family business in Kenya, and uh, there's another interesting question about being a family member and you get married. So we'll, we'll tackle these questions. I think thanks for that clarification. I just want to reemphasize here what Anthony has said. You see, the family business constitution for example, is recognized by the shareholders agreement. The shareholders agreement will say for the, for the shares that belong to the family, they will be managed as per the family business constitution. So the shareholders agreement recognizes as a family business constitution. So in that way, it's not really binding to the company, but to the family. So the family members cannot deviate from that. And that makes it dynamic. And as Anthony has said, as things change, then you can quickly change it uh, among the family members. So in a way, as we have said in the slide here, you include those other documents as appendices to the family business constitution. So uh, I want to, as we, I had promised that to we'll take uh, like a, a short break, I think I'm just about there. I want to invite uh, my colleague, Eddie, uh, Edda. Edda is our director for executive education. I think just a break, as we take the break, you'll talk about some of the programs you have in the business school, and then we'll proceed to now how do you write a family business constitution. So, Edda, uh, you can take up as I look at a few questions on the chat. Over to you, Edda. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mungai. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, I'd like to share my screen, so just to a little bit of the information that I would like to share. It's very brief on the programs that we have. So my name is Edda Waheto Munyi. I'm the Director of Executive Education at Strathmore Business School. So the entrepreneurship programs that we have that could be of benefit to you, we have various programs, but we thought we just uh, curate a few of the programs that we feel are very beneficial to the participants this afternoon. And one of them is the Family Business Program, which we are discussing today. Uh, part of the contents that uh, we are able to address in that particular program is what we are discussing today. And so we look in the family business, we look how can we grow an intergenerational business, but while still taking care of the family. So we are not disintegrating family as we grow the business that we can be able to grow together. And for those who are in Kenya, of course, I'm sure you have seen in the media last year, previous years, many years uh, before, having so many issues with family businesses and a lot of families disintegrating because of that. So we are saying, can we be able to address that? So it's a three-day program that we are running in July, and we look forward to having as many of you uh, in this call in that particular program. The other program is the Enterprise Development Program. And this program is structured in 16 half-day modules. So you come to class for a half day every week for 16 weeks. And this program looks at how can we move small businesses to medium sized enterprises. And so we are looking at uh, the structures, we are looking at creating business plans, uh, bankable business plans, because a lot of businesses are running, but they do not have business plans that probably Prime Bank can use to give loans. And there's all those sorts of things that we're able to address in that particular program. And so that enables you to grow that business from a small enterprise to a medium-sized enterprise. And then we have our owner manager programs and I'm glad to see uh, alumni of our enterprise development program as well as the owner manager program. And in this owner manager program, we are saying, how can we grow a sustainable business and move you from an owner manager to a business owner? And what is the difference? So the owner manager is the owner, but also managing the business, running the day-to-day uh, issues of the business, but the business owner then creates systems and structures 
that enable them to run a business and to grow the business even when they are not in the business. So they could go start another business or whatever else they want to do and they can grow. So the owner manager program, which uh, Dr. Mungai mentioned as the course leader, is a four module program. A module is one week. Three modules are in Nairobi and one module is in Lagos with our partner school, Lagos Business School. And that gives you an opportunity to also interact with entrepreneurs from the West African uh, market. Then on, we also have agribusiness programs under the Enterprise Center, which is where you're hosted today. And one of the programs there in agribusiness is investing in agribusiness primary production. And so we are saying, how can we move agribusiness to just moving from being subsistence kind of farming to being able to create wealth through primary production? So we look at the various chains, uh, whether it's hot culture, whether it's dairy, many uh, lines in, in agribusiness, and we look at the opportunities and the challenges they are in and how we can be able to address that, them from a business uh, side uh, point of view so that then you can grow the business that you're doing in primary production. Then we go to investing in agribusiness value addition. So we are saying, how can we add value to the products that we are producing from the primary production? But not just adding value, but understanding the market first before you can produce. So instead of producing and then looking for the market, we understand the market, what the market needs, we produce it, we package it the way the market wants, and that makes it easy for us to be able to sell in the market when we are ready. And then we have the financing agribusiness value chains. Uh, and probably this is interesting for Prime Bank. We are looking at the, the officers, the bank officers, microfinance officers, those who are, who are financing agribusiness and helping them to understand how to finance agribusiness, how to evaluate agribusiness value chains for financing, you know, understanding how they, they are doing whatever they are doing so that then you can know, is this a viable business that I can be able to give a loan? And if not, what can I advise them to do so that they can be ready? within a certain particular point of, in time. Then we have other leadership programs that uh, are also attract the corporate setup. So we have the new managers leadership program. It's a, an interesting program for you, even as an entrepreneur to send your team. And this is for the people that you have just promoted or are new in management. And they are looking at understanding how to transition from an individual contributor to a team leader. So issues of performance management, issues to do with communication, issues to do from body to boss. They were buddies, but now they have been promoted. How do they do that? So that is the new leader, new manager's leadership program. It's a one week program and it runs three times in a year. So you're able to send uh, participants in any one of those runs. So one run is in uh, May, the other run is in August and the other run is in November. Then we have the program for management development. This for your mid-level managers, and we are looking at how can we groom an all-round manager. So these are people who have a bit more experience as opposed to the new managers, and they're looking at growing and being able to deliver. At the end of the day, your mid-level management is where the rubber meets the road. They are the executors. They are, this is where the work is happening. So if you're able to strengthen your mid-level managers, then you're able to grow even the business to higher levels. So the program is four modules three in Strathmore and one at uh, Gordon Institute of Business Science in South Africa. So we have the three local modules and one international module. Then you have the senior managers leadership program. Uh, and this looks at moving your heads of department from specialists to generalists. So these are people who are experts in whatever they're doing. They're the head of finance, they're the head of marketing or such kind of a things. But you're looking at transitioning them from that specialist kind of a role into making them wear the CEO role or rather wear the CEO shoes. And when they are making the decisions, they can understand the impact it has in the business uh, at large. So again, the program is three, is four modules, three in Strathmore and one in Singapore at Nanyang Technical University. Then we have our advanced management program. Uh, this is where we are looking at how can we build sustainable legacy in our businesses. Um, and this has the CEOs as well as the executive directors we are looking at growing business, leaving the legacy, uh, even as you grow out of the business. And again, the program is four modules, two in Strathmore, one in Lagos Business School, and one in ESA in uh, Spain. Then we have the last program, uh, which we thought would be interesting, is our Global CEO Africa program. And this is a program, again, we are doing with um, Lagos Business School and Yale School of Management. So we are looking at how can we uh, create global impact 
uh, across, even across Africa. So we're saying Africa is a huge economy on its own. So how can we leverage on the economy that we have as Africans and grow Africa? So sort of creating that African narrative by Africans and for Africans. So we encourage you to join these programs. We encourage you to inquire even of more. There are many more other programs that are in, not in this list, but without these are some of the programs that would be of interest to you as a person, but also interest to you as a business for your, uh, for your teams, the teams that you're working with. So with that, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, we are delighted to have you and we look forward to even more interaction uh, after this. So thank you, Dr. Mungai. Uh, thank you, Eda, and uh, of course, uh, for that overview about the programs we have, I think uh, the, the whole thing about sharing those slides and uh, bring it in between is obviously it's possible to kind of a break, but they also to show people that uh, you know, these challenges we are facing is things that people have faced in the past. You know, so like the example I just gave you about what they did in Spain and how the companies are able to show to project these things exist. So those challenges you are facing, uh, like say in succession planning and how to manage it, uh, things that you can benefit by taking care of our problems. And if they are corporates, of course, uh, and we have seen some of the large family businesses bringing people to those programs that, that are corporate because one of the things that really help is interacting with people in corporate because then you're able to build a company to have a corporate structure, oral experience and the rest, okay? So, thanks a lot. So I want to proceed, I uh, have a few more slides and then we can now take, uh, and I will take one or two questions here. Um, as I go to the next slide, let me just take two questions. One, because they are related. One is by Lillian. Uh, Lillian asked if I'm a family member, a female family member, when I get married, does my husband automatically become a member of my family business too? Okay. Uh, and then it's related to another question uh, asked by Dixon, uh, Dixon Okumu, who asked, uh, we are talking about people marrying in, what about marrying out? Okay, so when someone gets married, do they leave the family business or what happens, okay? And I think these two questions, the reason I picked them is because they sort of cut across a bit of the things you have discussed, which is in essence, as you say, in the company side, you have the memorandum and articles of association that manage the governance of the company, how shares are moved, how directors are appointed, that's done. In the family business constitution, you as a family sit down and agree what will you be doing. And this is a conversation. This is a conversation that the family needs and the founder is key because they are passing their values to maybe their children on what they want to do. So some families, for example, could agree that when people get married in to the business, they become members of the family business constitution and then they have to sign it. So some families, could, other families could, could say no. When you get married, only the one you're getting married to is signed, whether it's the son or the daughter. So it depends on the family and what they have agreed. Of course, and that's a flexibility, it can be reviewed over time, okay? So let's summarize this thing. It's a family that decides what do they want to put in the family business constitution. Now the benefit of what I'm getting into is that in making those decisions, it's very important that people are advised on the pros and cons of being one or the other one, so that they can then decide which one to go for. The last question about Evans, closely related. If I am a founder and my children are still minors, you know, they are not of age to sign a contract or an agreement, what do I do? You see, the, I, I, this, I remind, I, this question Evans is good because it relates to a question we got earlier on about businesses for some that depend on use of brand. So you don't want that someone will come and start dividing the land or um, maybe one of the major assets that just kills the business. So you could have a family business constitution that says even if something happened to me, you can divide, but there are, you sell the business with the land, but don't start separating the land because there's no business to sell. Because if you get people who are young, they haven't thought about how the business works, they, they may just think we can split the land, but that kills the business or a major asset like that. So even if you are young and you have children, you could write it down so that in case something happens, then it's very clear why you thought that that's the way to go. 
Okay. Now, those things you can't put them in a memorandum, you can't put them in a will, you put them in a family business constitution. Let me go to the process of writing and I'll try to move so that we can take a few more questions. Uh, so, Hans, if you don't mind, uh, let's go to the slide. This is about now writing a family business constitution. And I've alluded to it uh, when uh, answering these questions. So, it's a process. Okay, it's, I like this graphic. I was looking for this picture because writing a family business constitution is a journey. It has curves, it is uphill, could go downhill, and the rest. But uh, from what we have seen, and uh, I think uh, it's Alex saying this has come on time, we're just doing up with the idea. After this webinar, I presume that people have a good idea what the, this is all about. Now, other members of the family may not have, okay? So it's very important that the first thing is to sensitize the family members about what's a family business constitution. And this normally is a joint meeting between the founders and the family members and obviously individuals in meetings with the individual family members. So here, for example, as a founder, you need, if you are writing the family business constitution, we need to get their mind, then talk to the family members and explain to them how what they have agreed can be captured in this document. Now, the experience is that it's also very important to talk individually to the different family members. I have one particular case of uh, someone we are trying to do that, and. Uh, you see, uh, like happens with the maybe in family business, you want the children to work in the business. And one child wants to go away <laughs> out of the country. And you know, they have a tag over now. He, and you can see where he's coming from. He's, uh, they, they want the son to have a very important position in the company, but the child might be somewhere else. Now, when you talk to that and you can look at explaining what's, why the father wants to work now, you can strike a balance, but everybody needs to understand, okay? So sensitization is very important. Now, preparation. Uh, so once people have been sensitized, they give their views, the person is the consultant who is helping you to write the family business consultant, then will come up with a draft. And then that becomes a basis for the discussion. And finally, the, the final one is agreed and adopted by signing. Now, the point is in the, this signing ceremony is supposed to be, quote unquote, something that is very public to the, member, to the family. So you want as many family members to be there. Remember, as you have said, it's better not to make this very legal. But the fact that you're in the meeting, the fact that you, you attended the sign, in a way, morally, you feel bound to respect what the other family members said. And this helps that if something was to happen, and we already agreed, for example, right? let's say he's a founder, and this is a trick issue. The founder, a discussion will be, will be done. When will the founder leave the business? Very tricky question. So, I remember one of the cases that says that the moment I appoint my son or my daughter as my deputy, in three years time, I have to hand over. Doesn't matter what happens. And it's that's written down. Now you say it in public, can everybody sees you sign, then you know, if you're the founder, you feel very tough to again, after three years, not hand over the business. So, so it may not be quite forced, but the fact that it's a public document or everybody agrees makes it very easy. But you will see a bit about the succession planning in, a, in, a, in a, a bit of detail because that's an important thing. Then using it, okay? So it's very highly recommended that family businesses have annual family meetings. This is not meetings to discuss the business. It's for people to know each other. As you grow, you have cousins, you have people who are married in the family, you have people who are marrying out. Now, why is this so important? First of all, of course, there are many things, but two important things. When you talk about people who can support the family business, most people always think about their own children. Yeah, but what, what happens is that you could have people who are cousins or who are distant relatives that may actually be a much stronger support for your family business. But the only way you're able to sell your family business to them is during these annual family meetings. Okay, so investing in those family meetings is key. And of course, you know, the other thing, of course, that they become your customers, they can help market the business and all the rest. Inducting, inducting of new family members, this is very important for marrying and getting married out, and periodic reviews and updates. Every three years, it's almost suggested that the family business consume need a review. It could be annual. So this is the process, and I'm married quickly and short, but that's the process. So sensitization, preparation, and then using it on a regular basis. Let's move on so that we can get the questions. Yeah, so this is a question about retiring. And again, here I put some research that supports why 
family business constitution support uh, uh, enhances succession planning. In this paper uh, that I give, retiring from the family business, uh, I think this was, uh, I forget the country, sure it's not Kenya, I'm trying to remember, they don't say. Eh? The idea was to try to see how successful uh, succession planning is done. As I'm using the word twice, okay? But uh, what these people found out that uh, it's, people don't have the same retiring method. You know? So they identified four ways in which people retire. There are people who are monarchs who do not leave the office unless they are forced. Okay, so there are people like that. And you see, when you're writing the family business constitution as family members, then you know <laughs> this person is a monarch. And that's the truth of it. So then you will structure your family business constitution knowing that the person is not going to leave the business as, as, until it is forced up. Then you also have the generals, okay? And these are people who spend their time uh, retirement planning a comeback. So they go, but they have planned to come back. You hear that they want to leave, then all of a sudden they change the rules. Now, if you are the, the children of a founder and you realize this one, you see, one thing is start fighting and bring down the business. The other thing is to accept that the founder is a general and you structure your family business constitution to deal with that. Okay. Then you have governors, okay, who live willingly and maintain no contact, they just leave. And then you have ambassadors, which is like the ideal situation who live willingly, but also serve as advisors to the farm. In fact, if you look at those companies that uh, Mr. Bala was telling us, you know, you realize that the founders remain as advisors. Uh, they are ambassadors because they have a lot of credibility, but they don't get involved in management. So why does a uh, family business constitution help this one? Because in the process, I've just gone through the previous slide, of writing it, the family will be able to know that the founders are in one of these four categories. And then structure the family business constitution to ensure that the succession will occur in a good way when the time comes. Okay, and uh, this paper, if you you will get the slide and then you can look at it, you will see that once this is done, then the succession becomes an, uh, much easier uh, to manage. Next slide, uh, Hans. It's not always the case. So here I'll, I'll bring my friend uh, Anthony Gross again because of last year. We wanted to highlight here something that you have seen in the family in a Strathmore Dispute Reserve Centre, the challenge of companies going to court, not just because of succession, but for commercial cases. The slide we have here is extracted from the report that was released in January this year. It's not even a month old, but was looking at the performance of the judiciary up to last year, June, they are, they are current, they are anyway. Year. We have to congratulate the judiciary. They have really improved these numbers. If these num numbers are scary, you should have seen them a couple of years, okay? So you can see actually back in six, uh, 2014, 2015. Because of COVID, we almost back to where we are. What the green numbers, this is the pending criminal and civil cases as of June, 2020. We have 620,000 there about pending cases. The commercial ones, as you can see, the civil ones are about 330. The criminal ones are about 300. So this is a number of cases we have at the background. So you can actually see the judiciary has been working to reduce the cases, but all of a sudden there has been uh, a pickup and the peak is obviously coming, unfortunately, from the pending criminal cases. Now, if you have a family business dispute and you go to court today, you are joining this queue. And this is something that people have not uh, anticipated. Let's go to the next slide so that uh, people can. This is another uh, analysis to see. There are about 10% of cases that are over five years that are still in court. And by the way, that number, uh, Justice Maraga was very focused on bringing that number down. We have to congratulate where effort has been put. So that number used to be much higher. Now, we have just seen 600, over 600,000 cases. So we're talking about 60,000 cases that are in court at the moment that are over five years old. I mean, just, just to imagine. Now, those numbers, that means if you are running a family business or you have a family issue, you keep going to court over five years, okay? So what we have been trying to, to push very strongly because we see to access that before families can go to court, they try to resolve the disputes outside court. The good thing is that this process works. Okay, the process of resolving disputes, especially using mediation, works. Next slide for me. 
the judiciary have actually taken a lead. These numbers in this slide shows what the courts did. The court annex mediation is a department, let's call it that, within the judiciary that uh, encourages people to resolve disputes using mediation. So you go to court and the judge looks at this and tells you, no, why don't you try to resolve this case outside? Go for mediation. So they created what is called the court annex mediation. You can see last year, we have about over 2,000 and something cases that were referred to court. And this about 50% is 5149. 50% or less was solved within, and you know, the, the duration for this is three months, 90 days. So you can actually see that of these 2,000 cases or there about half of them were resolved within three months, because that's the duration that they give, the judiciary gives for these cases. And we have seen that practice even here in Strathmore, we have, when you have hard cases refund for mediation. Next slide for me, uh, Hans. I wanted to, uh, to invite my friend, Anthony Gross. This is one case that uh, we dealt with, uh, I think it's last year, uh, where a case had been called for over nine years. Nine, okay? Until the family decided to be tired and they came to us in the Strathmore Dispute Resolution Center to resolve the case. Uh, Anthony Gross, uh, would you like to share some experience on this matter? Thank you. Um, are you hearing me, Edward? Yes, yes. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, I mean, it, it, the, the statistics are reasonably interesting. Um, they go on about um, the amount of money put back into the economy. Uh, that's not as relative as the amount of cases that are actually um, going for mediation or being settled, because in a family business, you are much more likely <clears throat> to have disputes of uh, family members and uh, high emotion. And those are just as difficult to resolve. And those are the uh, disputes that really need a softer touch of mediation rather than going to court. The other thing uh, about the courts with a big high-end value uh, multi-company um, family business is that uh, there are so many parties involved that it takes years and years. And by the time anybody's ready to go to hearing, the judge has moved on or died or been um, taken to another station. So, and the statistic of 1,113 1, settlements, well, that's excellent um, and to be congratulated. But if, you, if we're looking at an arrears of 600,000 and a family business dispute gets caught up in that, you can see that that's, uh, that's uh, not too um, um, optimistic. So for all these reasons, the idea of the family constitution will put in a predetermined mediation clause whereby you will determine how you are to appoint the mediator or who the mediator is pre-appointed. And you will direct timelines whereby any family member who's dissatisfied with any matter or declares a dispute will go to mediation, not within three months, I wouldn't think. We can do one much quicker than that because it can be within seven days and thereafter the mediator must call a meeting within seven days and thereafter the world statistic for successful mediation is probably one day. Maybe with big, company, with big families you need uh, several more sessions, but you know, the concept is still there. Where there is a will with a way, and if everybody comes to the table, there's no reason with the help of a third party neutral that um, everybody can have their say, and slowly, slowly, they can get to the bottom of the um, dispute, and hopefully uh, in the hands of a good mediator, um, affect um, a resolution. Thank you, uh, Anthony, for that. Yeah, so I think just to build on your last point uh, about uh, family business, I, I, we have been involved in those cases and I think, as you have said, one day is enough to sit down. This, we can see this particular case where they were in a court for nine years, but within one day of sitting down, they were able to solve the issue. I think it's good for people to know that now again in Kenya, uh, once you agree uh, on a Mediation, that decision can be filed in court and it becomes like a, the decision of the court. So somebody cannot go back track and say we did not discuss, okay? Uh, because that has been a challenge of people saying, okay, if we agree in the mediation, can we enforce it? So the judiciary has moved ahead 
and enacted those rules, and I think they are, they are op operationalizing them to make sure that, like, if you come to the Stratum of Disputation Center and you agree, you can actually file that and become like a decision of the court. So I think the big message here is that when you write the family business constitution, if you don't include a dispute resolution clause, then what you do is open the door to go to court. But if you already have that clause, if somebody goes to court, the judge will just say, okay, in your family business constitution, you are required to go for mediation first. And like Anthony has said, uh, globally about 80% of cases get resolved uh, in mediation. Uh, we obviously can have another session on mediation. Uh, next slide, I'm trying to move the slide. Uh, we are coming to the end of this. So this is almost my last slide, uh, the value of marriage family farms. This, I think it's an interesting twist. And there are people who have asked about marriage, okay? Uh, I write this paper that in Iran, the marriage of a family member of the controlling family adds value to public corporations. So family farms stock prices if the partner is from either prominent business or political family. So marriage is important, okay? Especially for key family businesses, okay? And uh, you know, this study is very interesting because of course I looked at big companies, but you know, so-and-so got married, so-and-so. Why is that important in countries like Iran? Because of the power of networks. And I'm not sure we are very different in Kenya or in other East African countries, or even globally, you know, because there's some people when they come, uh, they bring a lot of a lot of power with the connection they bring. Now, of course, you don't want to force it, but the harvest is good. And you can see the question that the region was asking or uh, this one, you know, it depends now on the family business concern you have, because depending on who has married who, you may want to go back and revisit your family business constitution. In contrast, as you can see, divorces have even a higher but negative impact on family business for, for well-known fa uh, family businesses. So if there's a huge divorce case that is going on, it does not just damage the family, it also damages the family business. So it's important that uh, people who are in family business keep an eye on what's happening on children and their, the families that get married in, okay? Especially for high profile family businesses, okay? So it's, it's again, go back to the family council. So once you figure out that marriage is something that can actually have a huge impact, okay? On the, if the marriage does not work, if it works, good. If it doesn't work, uh, serious. Then you want to take care of it, okay? So one of the things that I put there is, for example, with this realization, you can actually say that we need in the family business constitution to recognize how we can support families because we know the impact that can have on the business. Of course, you leave that free, but this is one of the considerations you could put up there, okay? So family funds depend on capable years and stable marriage to stay afloat, okay? So it's not something that uh, should be taken for granted. Now I want to finish. I think uh, that must be it. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so these are the conclusions we have, uh, and then we can uh, take up uh, the q and I think we have about 10 minutes. So in conclusion, uh, we are saying that the family business constitution is an agreement among family members on how the family can support the business and vice versa. Okay, so it's two way, okay? So you have to look at the business we support. Um, again, the statistics that shows globally, like now in the period of COVID, and all the challenges that you're facing, most family business will survive compared to purely private business. And the reason is the family business, the family members who work in their family business can reduce significantly, for example, their income, their salaries, to make sure that the family business continues to exist. So this is a good example of where the family sacrifices itself to support the family business. And this is something we recognize globally, okay? It's not uh, just unique for COVID. So it goes both ways, okay? So you could have an agreement in the family business constitution on how the family would support the business in case the business was in trouble, okay? So you don't need it. And then the second one is about the positive impact on both performance and succession planning. We have touched on that. We have emphasized that this should be aligned to other legal documents, like shareholders agreement, the will, uh, if you have a trust, all those things. So, and that therefore requires uh, involvement of a legal mind when you come to write the family business constitution. Include a dispute resolution clause and preferable mediation, that's the last thing I said. 
Uh, we have said, and we talked about this, so I wanted to put it in the slide, that we'll set your name with a temperate family business constitution from the dispute resolution center using the emails that you register. Okay, so that those of you are interested in writing one, then you can write and get a quote uh, from SDB what to date cost your business to write a family business constitution. But the template will be sent to everyone. So you can look at it, you want to sit down and modify it, fine. But if you want to involve the, uh, the dispute, then you obviously can get a quote. Why is important? As you saw, depending on the size of the family, depending on the size of the business, this can take a short time, can take a long time, how available the people are, all those things. Eh? And then finally, uh, I think my colleague Ed has mentioned about some of the programs you have. So I wanted to put some emails there. And the one thing that you have was not mentioned is about the first, the last one on families. We run courses on parenting. And now you can see how the rope comes. Eh? So we, we realize a strath more the importance of families in the family business. So those courses you run on parenting is not just support the families, which is good, but also we know that if there are problems in the family, it will go to the business. And I put the name of Ivri and I put her email there, and then you can get a list of the parenting courses that are there. So these slides will be for you, and therefore you can share. I think that's it. Uh, Hans, I think um, we are through. I want to give it back to you, and then we can take one or two questions. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, back to you, Hans. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mungai. Sorry for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a very um, deep conversation. Um, I'm hoping we are, we are slowly gravitating from uh, being a monarch <laughs> to being an ambassador of your business, even as you prepare to ensure that your business has a good succession of this family uh, business constitution. We'll take, uh, because of time, maybe we might just end up taking one or two questions, but we, we want to appreciate for um, the interest, and the main questions that have come for. And um, Dr. Mungai, there's a question here about um, a business where it's a partnership. And uh, the one part of it is have invested in our family. Uh, and the other part is just the partner. So the question is, uh, who writes the family? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll answer Hans' question. And as I do that, we'll put a poll, the last poll, uh, to evaluate how you have done, uh, now that we saw what was happening at the beginning. So then I'll be answering the question and two more that I have written, uh, written so that we can launch the poll. So in partnership. So the question of partnership uh, goes back to who likes the family business constitution? It's the family, it's not the partners. So if I'm a partner uh, with someone else, with other people in a, in a business, myself with my family will sit down and write a family business constitution to sort of agree how will we be uh, interacting ourselves with the other partners. So it's the partner individually that delights their family business with their own family. The other partners could do the same. So it governs the family, not the partnership. I think this is clear. And I can elaborate on that if necessary. Uh, there's a question about getting the slides. We'll obviously share, we will share the slide as soon as possible after this. I think people want to have about it, to, to see about it. Uh, there was a question about family charter and uh, the family business. Uh, it depends on what is on the charter. On the charter. Normally, uh, for boards, you have a board charter, which governs how the board operates. So I think you have given the content of what the family business is all about. Sorry, my, I put off my video so I can't be seen. Thank you. So the family charter depends on the content. Okay, As I said, in some countries, it's called a family protocol. It's called some a creed. So it depends on the content. So it could be, it may not. What's important is what's the content of the family charter. Because as I said, we know about board charters, which governs how the boards manage each other. Thanks, Hans. Uh, I can see the questions are being answered. So I don't know how many people have responded. 40%. Let's get more. Or oh, you have crossed. <laughs> Fine. OK. Uh, Hans, any more questions? I think there are some of the other questions are technical around how to a family investment as a society of welfare. 
Um, there was also a question on, um, okay, what value does a holding company add to the family business constitution? Um, okay, fine. Okay, yeah. so if uh, I would like to, we, we look at the question as we give our team time to conclude, we like to respect your time. And, but uh, around me, I, as uh, our team is uh, giving their closing remarks, if there's something we can respond. But if somebody feels that it's a real question that they really want to ask, they could also leave their hand electronically and then we we'll try to see what the question is all about. Otherwise, thank you very much. We'll give our contacts. It's our hope and wish uh, from Strathmore, from Prime Bank, from Invest in Africa, that this session would just, as uh, Mr. Barat said, one of the many. So part of the feedback we will be looking for is whether you want more of this session, whether you want more mediation, whatever it is, because we want family business to be like what has happened in those countries. They really protect the economy. They really protect jobs. But you have to deal with the issues of succession planning and ownership. This is governance. And what we are trying to do here is just one step in that direction. So that, thank you very much and back to you, Hans. Okay. We have uh, barely just two minutes to go. I want to indulge uh, and request you for two more extra minutes so that we have we conclude at two minutes past so that we allow a few minutes um, to pass a vote of confidence. But even so, I want to invite you to share with us some feedback on the chat. Please drop a comment there on um, how you have found the session to be. Has it been relevant to you? And um, possibly any topics of interest beyond uh, the topic we've, we've discussed today. Please, uh, please feel free to drop that on, um, on the chat um, even as we wind up um this uh, discussion today so allow me to at this point invite back uh, my co-host um eunice to just do a vote of thanks as we conclude thank you hans uh, and thank you dr mungai for such a wonderful presentation uh, what i have learned today from all the speakers is that uh, business is about making profit, whereas uh, family is about unconditional love. But in most cases, these two do not align. And so I would like to encourage each one of us to join hands, academia, industry, government, families, to join hands in pro family business uh, through you, you, you know, helping these businesses to to run professionally and even to run uh, ethically. And so uh, I, I encourage all of us to actually join hands, so hands together, and so that we can be able to grow very successful family businesses that will also trickle down to uh, uh, promoting our nation and also promoting the whole world. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone that made this a success. Uh, it wouldn't have been successful without all of you. I want to start uh, thanking our partners. Thank you, Prime Bank. Thank you so much for your support. And thank you for believing in us. And thank you for accepting to walk this journey of family business together. Thank you, Invest in Africa, MasterCard Foundation, for also honoring our invitation and partnering with us. We know that we have come a long way and we are also going very far with you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Strathmore University Business School Management because of allowing us to run this webinar and of course approving the topic. Uh, I also want to thank all the participants, especially the ones that have stayed until this time. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for commitment. Thank you for, you know, uh, accepting to, to join us and even to learn because we keep learning. And thank you, thank you very much participants. Uh, I also want to thank our alumni. I have seen a lot of alumni that joined this webinar today. That means that they are happy with our program. That means that they are, they are happy with the topic. We are so grateful alumni that you, you have continued uh, partnering with us and even making our programs known outside there. I also want to thank the organizing committee and the organizing committee of this webinar uh, was uh, a combination of you know, the three partners. 
the Strathmore University business. The marketing team, our IT, uh, our, um, uh, our, 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 our partners, the, the, the Invest in Africa, Prime Bank, Strathmore University team, uh, all of us came together to plan this webinar and we are so uh, grateful. So uh, with all that, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, and the way forward is that we are going to keep calling you for uh, this webinars. You are wanting to know your feedback. Uh, what are the topics you want us to cover? What else do you want to learn? And we shall be ready to, you know, to put together our minds together with industry, with you alumni, with you participants, with you entrepreneurs, with you owners of uh, medium-sized companies to bring together the, the, the topics that you want us to, to, you know, to articulate on and that way we can grow our family businesses. So thank you very much. Back to you, Hans. Thank you very much, Eunice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at 5.03. I see uh, Elizabeth Wanjiku's hand is raised. I don't know if Elizabeth, you wanted to ask a question or maybe you wanted to close for yes, us with a prayer. Yes. Uh, no, I wanted to ask a question. Yes, please. Yeah, so thank you for this session. Um, so my question is, uh, it's like it's very clear there's a culture within like, okay, I don't want to say, you know, Kenya, there's a culture of uh, when we people start businesses here, they start them uh, from a person when we start businesses, we started from the perspective of you want to be able to pay your rent. You want to be able to, you know, do the normal sustainable things for the family. Um, and so when when the, when the, when now we talk about family businesses, which is more about changing it to the next generation and building a business that goes to the next generation, then um, changing changing this mindset Stop from just it. from just the feeding, uh, the feeding, the rent, the normal day to day, the school fees, and all of this, and saying I'm changing it now to become a sustainable next generation business. How, um, so I wanted the, uh, Mr. Mungai to cover that one and answer on how that happens, apart from the change of mindset that should definitely happen. How else is this culture supposed to develop that now we build businesses that uh, go to the next generation? Hey, Dr. Mungai, uh, okay. just one minute. Okay, Elizabeth. Thanks for the question. I realize that uh, we are past time, so I'll be a bit brief. Yeah, so when founders start a company, they normally have an interest of what they want to do. And like you say, some people just start it because they want to survive, pay fees and the rest. But as the business grows, they want to grow it. So what we need to do is for those people that the business have grown, then uh, it's it, like you see, it's a change of mindset, but exposure to other businesses is one important way in which to change the mindset. And I think that's where the strength, for example, for coming for programs comes in, because you get to meet people that started businesses in a small way, but because of interacting with other people, they actually realize they can do much more. I think the challenge, if you want me to put it across, is that if you have a talent to start a business and you're able to grow it, you actually have a very unique capability that you should use to solve the problems that you have for society, creating jobs, creating wealth. So you may start a business with a way to take care of your family, but that's quite limited, especially if you come up with a business that can scale. So I think, as you mentioned, it's a question of changing the mindset and people not being exposed to the possibility of growing the business. Because you obviously would hope that people would like to have impact in society, not just their own families. But you know, if somebody don't have that kind of a mindset, then they need to be inculcated. So being in a network or being interacting with the people that have done these kind of things helps. I mean, when you look, and then you also you have the society to, to help the whole di dynamics. When you look at the US, which is obviously one of the best examples you can quote here, you have that different states compete 
on the basis of which state has a group of company. Okay, so you're not just satisfied with taking care of the family, you want to grow a company to a group of companies. So this in the United States, you know, you talk about Mississippi, they have 3M, you talk about CNN is in Toronto, I don't know where. So different states, so in Kenya, for example, you'd imagine that the county government will be willing and supporting business that can grow. So that you start talking about this county has this family business that is really providing jobs to that. And if you are the one running that family business, you should feel the urge to grow the company that way. But it's a mindset issue, it's exposure issue. And I think I, my challenge is that those who have the talent should use it to do what they are supposed to do. Thank you. Uh, that's my comment. Uh, Hans, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mungai. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we already have overshot your time and uh, we want to request that then we bring this to a close. I must mention that uh, there was a, a question or maybe someone who had asked uh, for some information on products from Prime Bank um, and Prime Bank has responded and uh, given us a contact of Ms. Sarah Kipto and the contact is on the chat. Please feel free to contact her so that you can get to know more about the products at uh, Prime Bank. It is just in the interest of time that then we humbly request that we bring this to us, ladies and gentlemen, our partners. We are sincerely grateful for the opportunity and we look forward to um, the conversation continuing. Please let the conversation not end here. Um, I, I see a number of people have also even shared their contacts. Uh, it will be great for us to continue to have this conversation. We have your contacts as well. And from our end, we are also going to engage with you um, and I think as we close, Dr. Mungai, did you have any just final word to say and so that we can draw the curtains down? Thank you. So I've just been reminded by a friend of mine here because uh, this friend of mine knows me very well. You know, I was making a joke about families and all this. So he said, why don't you share with people about your hobby? Okay. And so I thought, let me do it as a way of closing. So my hobby is obviously uh, one of the things I like is to always have good families. Okay, and one of the things we realize is, of course, that uh, having, having good family starts with having good gentlemen with good ladies. And uh, from my experience, these opportunities are very rare. So I have a hobby where I organize opportunities for young ladies and young men who are looking for husbands or wives to meet. Okay, so I'm going to put a post on the, on the chat. Uh, it may not be for you, but you may know people that qualify to be in this group, so you can go to the website and look for that detail. And uh, that's, that's it for now. Uh, so it's mediatrixhealth.com slash webinar. mediatrixhealth.com slash webinar. So you see the webinars that you organize there. That is a, a healthcare yeah. service provider. Uh, and there are many issues why that uh, fits there, but you go to that link, you'll be able to see more details. So... If you have any comments, you can also write to me. My email is on the website, on the slides. If you want more details, I can share with you. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Mugai. I think in other words, Dr. Mugai is saying uh, in his other life, he's a matchmaker. And the Valentine's is very close in case you know a friend, a friend who knows another friend and who needs to be assisted with the matchmaking. There's a consultant here on the side. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, Dinesh, your hand has been raised. Uh, maybe if you wanted to say something, you can say, but ladies and gentlemen, feel free. We are not holding you back. Uh, maybe this is just a final one uh, from the boy child side. Dinesh. All right, then um, I think from. Good. Unmute like Mr. Dimesh. Okay. Hans, you need to unmute Mr. Dimesh. Dimesh. We can't hear him. Okay. Um, host the. Uh... Hans, we need to. Okay, now right, finally. Dimesh. 
Yeah, I, I think I had a great time listening to the whole uh, discussion. It's fantastic. I really appreciate the way Strathmore and the other uh, people who have brought this together. Mine is only one uh, that uh, I'm sure Strathmore gets such groups time and again, and I'm sure you have a big database. If this was being shared, you know, it would really add value for each and every participant in these groups and add value in the sense that uh, sharing such uh, information or uh, pro, uh, people who have gone through things and such things. Plus, it would add also add in the sense that we would be able to create a business uh, groups into this and see how we can air, help each other and grow businesses for each other. Like may, I, I was a member at BNI and uh, it, it adds a lot of value in such a way and Strathmore has the capability and capacity to do this. And uh, already you are having a lot of uh, small businesses come forward, uh, joining hands with Strathmore. So it would be an added value for Strathmore plus to all the participants and uh, the people who uh, come and join in such uh, forums. I don't know if that would add value for our, if that could be a created value for all of us. Absolutely, Dinesh. Um, it, it will add value. And I think the main takeaway from such forums is networking. And yes, we, from our end, we'll see what we can be able to do to facilitate, but also to ensure that the conversation can continue beyond the sessions that we have here in the, on the webinars. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We want to wish you the very best as we wind down the week. Um, special appreciation from our partners. And we want to wish you also in advance um, a happy Valentine Yay. and success in uh, the new year. All the best. Thank you very much for joining us today.